It is Friday, October 7th, 2016. This is Room in the Trees, a podcast about making art, life, creativity, getting out there, getting it done, about all those things. This is episode number 23, the worst painting you can possibly make. Room in the Trees is hosted by Sabrina Harrison and me, Trent Reynolds. Show notes including pictures, links, video, and more for every episode can be found at roominthetrees.com. If you are enjoying the podcast, please take a moment to rate us on iTunes, which you can get to by going to roominthetrees.com backslash iTunes. And if you would like to show your monetary support, you can become our patron at patreon.com backslash room. I have a couple shout outs, a couple new Patreon subscribers. Uh, A thank you, big, warm, heartfelt, gooey thank you to Melanie Price and Kate Oberreich. Oberreich? whatever it may be. (laughs) Thank you to Kate and Melanie. You guys are awesome. We really appreciate all your support. And now with Sabrina's permission, I'm going to take a minute and just give you a small update about uh, what's happening here at Dablon Studio. I'm coming up on five months in the new studio space, and my lease is over in next month. November November 8th is the last day of my uh, current lease. I have not been able to make it financially worthwhile to be here renting the space. Uh, there have been some wonderful successes, and I've learned a tremendous amount, um, but so far I've not been able to make it financially feasible to, to stay here. So I wanted to uh, put this out into the universe and put it out to you podcast listeners If there is anyone in the L.A. area, Santa Monica area, that um, is interested in talking about some ideas or interested in possibly using the space for uh, a workshop of your own or for creating art, um, please contact me. Any ideas that you have, I would be willing to entertain. I would love to be able to keep this space and continue building a, a community here. You can contact me through the website at roominthetrees.com or you can contact me directly or leave me your contact information by emailing dabblon d-a-b-b-l-e-o-n at gmail.com thanks very much and here is the episode it's monday yay i'm excited about this topic for about five minutes i i could not think of any assignment whatsoever but then I had I was struck with inspiration what we are talking about today some of our favorite assignments yes yeah so when you when you thought of this what what did you have in mind specifically are you thinking like assignments from high school or just kind of in general um I'm actually thinking of assignments from college when I was at art school oh okay (laughs) Well, good, because I wasn't thinking from high school either, but since that's kind of where our origin story starts, I I didn't know if that's what you had in mind. I don't remember anything in high school, except, uh, I don't remember, (laughs) except I didn't, I didn't either. Oh my God. I I feel like I have to share for the podcast, my, my fail from last week's turning my book proposal just to follow up. Oh yes. That's a great fail. (laughs) So Last Monday, I turned in my proposal, my pages, and so on. And over the weekend, I think it was, maybe it was Friday, um, so four four or five days had gone by, I was kind of rereading through uh, the proposal. And uh, one part, I just, I talk about Room in the Trees and how um, I started this with my old friend from high school, (laughs) Trent Reynolds. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, I don't think I said high school though I think I just said old friend I think I really did just say old friend and uh, and I've written that description about 
that about creating room in the trees, pretty much the same text for multiple things. I've, you know, described it that way. Well, I had, <laughs> I reread it and it said, um, in 2016, I, my only friend, my only friend, <laughs> my only friend Trent and I started the Room in the Trees podcast. So I said only instead of old. It makes such a difference. I'm just picturing someone who knows nothing about Room in the Trees starting to read that like her I'll only. Bet you, I'll bet you anything that it was just like an autocorrect thing. Where it was know. totally an autocorrect thing. It was totally an autocorrect thing. I had... <laughs> Oh, that's, that's when you wonder if like somebody doesn't have a sense of humor that's in charge of this autocorrect thing, because that is just, I don't know, how do, how do things like that happen? Like that feels too intentional. It's just, it, it's funny when one word changes the whole context, because then it sounds like this really lonely podcast about like, with my one friend in my life, we just started this very sad conversation about and this is what you submitted to your editor. Yeah, yeah. So awesome. I, it was funny because I did call and I couldn't stop laughing. I was like, I just need to just share an epic fail in regards to my, <laughs> what I sent. And she started, they started laughing. So, yeah. So I carefully reread it today, but I'm sending it back in. Uh, so we're talking about some of our favorite assignments. I, some of them really stand out in my mind from college. Do you want to start one off, Trin? Uh, sure. I my uh, what I'd like to share requires a little bit of context, cool. if you don't mind. Yeah. So when you first told me you texted me that uh, this idea, I was really struggling to even remember any assignments. But then I remembered one of my favorite all-time classes and the teacher of that class. And I'd like to share three of the assignments that he gave in that class. And this is from grad school at the School of the Art, Instit Art Institute of Chicago. And the, the teacher was Galen Gerber. Great um, name. Who's, Great. Who's a fantastic. Yep. Solid name. Solid name. To give a little background. So was this your first year there? Give a little context of like, were you nervous? Was it, what class was it? What, what so was it? the deal with the class is this, and um, it was, I can't even remember what the class was listed as. I think it was just called like art practices or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so, something really ambiguous. And But I just had heard so many, much good about uh, Galen Gerber. I was told that I just need to take a class from him no matter what. And what it ended up being is just a group of maybe 10 of us that would get together once a week for this class. And I think it was two or two or three hours long. And the whole class was just going around in a circle talking about what we had done that week. And then he would kind of mediate this discussion between us and then give us assignments of what we were supposed to do for the following week. So meaning you know, individual assignments, or? individual assignments. Oh. And so kind of what it ended up being more like is uh, a group therapy session. And he would give these, these like really strange, but pointed and wonderful assignments. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Great. And really this is just me telling you how much I love and revere Galen Gerber and how much he has affected my own perception of what teaching art uh, is and can be. I, I would I would love at the end of my life for somebody to compare me to Galen, Galen Gerber. Mm. Just have a lot of love and respect for him. Anyway, so I'm excited to, to just share some memories of Galen Gerber. Great. So there was this girl in the, in, uh, in the class that had a lot of anxiety. And she was embarrassed to show the projects that she had been working on. And they ended up to be really, you know, these kind of cool animations. And But you could tell she just had this insecurity about, um, about what she had done. And even the fact that she was there at school. I think mm. she was an undergrad at the School of the Art Institute. Art Institute of Chicago. Turns out her father is, uh, is a big time entertainer. Um, and she felt like she was kind of in his shadow and could never mm. kind of match up. And he wasn't a very warm, uh, wasn't a very warm father to her or something like that. It's been long enough that I can't remember the exact details, but she had all this anxiety surrounding her identity as an artist. So uh, Galen Gerber gave her the assignment of that she had to tell three people that she didn't know that she was an artist. And that was it. Oh, I love that. 
And I loved it. And it was so perfect for her. And part of the part of the difficulty of communicating what I'm, you know, these assignments is just understanding the personality of the person he was giving this assignment to. It was so perfect for this girl. I mean, she was so anxious about uh, about her identity and you could tell that when he gave that assignment, it was like way out of her comfort zone. And she did not want to do that. And so she did it, right? So what happened? And she did it. And the next week she came in all smiles, like excited to tell us about her experience telling three different people that she didn't know that she was an artist. And uh, and it was wonderful. Like you could tell that it made a big difference in her psyche of just owning that title and and like enrolling other people, you know, enlisting other people and believing that about her as well. You know, like, mm. um, I don't know. I think getting it out of her head and out of her heart and, and out of this kind of ang- anxious cloud and putting it into the world and telling somebody in a way that they would believe you, you know, that that, that act is, is a very potent one. I, all of a sudden, it's not just you; it's somebody else in the world. It's not in, in three other people in the world now that know that you're an artist and you're owning that. So, it was awesome. It was just perfect for this person, and so good for the rest of the class to think of that same thing and how we uh, relate to this title mm-hmm. and this owning our our um, our identity. So, uh, what do you got? I remember one of my favorites was um, in, I went to CCAC, now it's called CCA, California College of the Arts, in um, the Bay Area. And it was my freshman year, and it was, I think it was a 3D, 3D kind of elective class, or a prime, not a foundation class. Um, and I'm not remembering my teacher's name, but I can totally picture her. Um, shoot, I can't remember her name. Um, but what we had to do, um, was create a three-dimensional autobiographical book. Mm. And the limitations were it could be as small as something you wear around your neck or as big as something you walk through. Mm. And I love that. I love that extra part about like to just open, kind of way open your mind to the possibilities um, I, it made you think about all, just like, how do you, how, what shape, what form, what way do you tell your story of your life? What, um, is it moving? Is it how, in what way is it tactical? Um, you know, what kind of object is it? What kind of scale is it? How, how, accessible is it um Mm. it just was fantastic i ended up creating these um you know as kids you'd have like building blocks where you turn them all one way and then makes a picture and then you turn them all another way and it makes another picture like um like a elephant or a you know dinosaur or something you know like Mm -hmm. you know what i'm talking about those like square blocks yeah okay um so I did that, and I had each one be a different theme, um, and then one of them be, I it was back in the day of letter letterpress, like where you rubbed rub down type, and I did it. So I cut down piece four by four, four inch squared um, blocks, and I just. I it's hard to describe how it all worked, but I loved I loved that project. I loved. I, it was one of the first projects that I felt really challenged me in an exciting way to hmm. think about my life in in that context of telling my story. Hmm. And then in the next year, I started making spilling open. So it was a that the notes and that that journal that I I did all the drawings and you know that process of investigating my story was probably a very linked to that project and spilling open too. Do you feel like that project has informed some of uh, the assignments or projects that you've created in your workshops? I was going to say, I've loved g- giving that assignment. I've probably done it twice. Um, usually if it's a, 
multi-week um, workshop. Uh, I'd love to do it again when I start teaching online. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's nice to do over a series of weeks. It's really it's wonderful. I think with all of these these projects, you know, probably the ones that we feel most intensely about, it's not like somehow they are the they create a way for you to to see like open you up to new potential. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a fine line hard thing to do because you want to give enough instruction and like steps and you want to give this project enough definition for your students to know what they're doing, but you don't want to give too much definition and wrap it up too tightly, or it just becomes about one isolated thing instead yeah. of like opening your mind up to how this relates to the larger world. I don't know. I've, I've always found that a really fascinating balance to strike. I just liked, I, I, what I love and I miss about art school was the conversations, you know, the feeling of talking through a project, like talking through your ideas for how you're going to kind of tackle that, the assignment. That's what I love about assignments. It's not something where you, you're given it and you go off in a closed room and you just have to figure it out and you have to come up with something. It's the dialogue of, huh, that, and then someone else says, well, that makes me think of this. And then, you know, right. asks you a question further. And yeah. I think I'm I'm right on board with that, and that's what I love so much about this class that I'm telling you about is is the dialogue. Is that when he gave these assignments to other people, it was this opportunity to to ask those questions and envision myself in that assignment, you know, and like and when they came back and there was this conversation about what happened and how it affected them, like it was so generative. Everybody's everybody's assignments started to relate to one another, you know, and opened up this conversation that I thought was. Uh, I'm curious was what yours, what, what he gave you. Oh, I'm going to tell you. Yeah. It's going to be my third one. Well, what's his second yeah, one? I, I miss, I miss that about art, art school too, though, is, mm -hmm. is this conversation that art making became more of a community effort, you know, and a community learning type thing. And that's definitely something I miss. Yeah. Um, okay. So the second the second assignment, there was this uh, kid in the class. Um, this guy, he was also, I think, an undergrad. So I think there was maybe two other graduate students besides myself. Mm -hmm. It was most mostly undergraduate students, um, and he had this just kind of anger about abstract painting. He liked to make these really kind of comic book graphic style drawings. And, you know, it was all about representation. He really, and he was taking an, a class where he was being required to do some, some abstraction. And he just had a lot of frustration and didn't, didn't yeah. drink the Kool-Aid, didn't believe yeah. in abstraction. Um, so his assignments were, was to make two paintings that were the worst paintings he could possibly make. Oh, I love that. Two oh. of the worst paintings that he could possibly make. And then the, the next week when he brought these two things back, we had a serious critique about these two paintings. That is so awesome. <laughs> and what ended up happening is that he made two pretty interesting, <laughs> interesting <laughs> looking paintings, like so much, prob probably so much more interesting than what he was doing, you know, seriously for himself. And, and I don't think it was, it was it wasn't meant as an assignment to get him like into abstraction right but i think that process of i don't know there's so much so much i think that that could be unpacked from that assignment yeah but um it it uh oh goodness i can't even there's makes so me want to do it right now like it's yeah. such a great assignment what was what what would just can you describe a little bit of what the paintings were like like, could he choose any size? Was he working with? He could choose any size. He can use any medium. It was just, it, you know, whatever. So what he, he ended up doing this size that was kind of, you know, uh, um, like nine by 12, maybe. <laughs> so right. kind of smallish easel painting. And he did two of them the exact same size, exact same canvas. He wanted to be at as boring and like stale <laughs> as possible. Like he didn't want the size to be impressive or, right. you know, it was just like right. hum two humble little <laughs> tur turd paintings. And, yeah. Um, I can't remember exactly what they look like. The one that I think we as a group decided was the stronger of the two was like uh, this. I just remember primarily a, a kind of neutral like brown color with a couple like 
yellow s- swipes on it. <laughs> anyway, it was like, <laughs> but when we, we brought in uh, somebody, uh, you know, an, another art teacher who wasn't aware of what the assignment no was. No way. He, oh, that's he was, great. He, he was supposed yeah. to just give, you know, a straightforward critique of the two paintings. And, and that guy, the, the other teacher that came in, chose the same painting of the two to be the stronger one of the two. So, uh, and that was another part of it is just like, not only were we giving these two paintings like, like a sincere critique, but we all chose one of the two as the stronger of the two. Mm. So, so there was this kind of reinforcement of like, there is a way to determine good and bad, strong and weak, something that's working for specific reasons and something that's not working. So it's kind of this legitimacy to the conversation that I think kind of opened his eyes to the fact that it's that abstraction isn't just this ruleless like chaos, you know, that there are guiding principles and, and ways of uh, engaging in a, you know, in a real way with yeah. when it doesn't have something that's recognizable. So I don't know. I I'm, I don't feel like I'm doing justice to to the what kind of nuanced. You, yeah. Uh, what what kind of was his experience? What do you remember? I mean, let's just tell everyone we didn't just graduate from college like six months ago. This was we right, both went to college like upwards of almost twenty years ago. So yeah. Yep. Yeah. So do you remember what his like how he responded to it or what kind of his reaction or and well the week before before he got the assignment he was angry about abstraction and when he got the assignment you could tell that he thought it was kind of funny but he was going to take it seriously like mm-hmm. he's not like he was just a very very sincere serious guy mm-hmm. um and when he came back you could i don't if that's the thing it's been so long ago i can't remember exactly how it went down but i remember him being um kind of incredulous that we had all chosen the same painting as the stronger of the two. Like he just could not wrap his mind around that or it was hard for him to wrap his, his mind around the fact that there could be a better and a worse between two equally stupid, ugly paintings. Like, like his eyes just were not trained to, to be able to see any kind of difference at all. So I think he... Th- he was kind of incredulous. He thought it was funny that we were even, you know, giving, spending the time critiquing these two paintings that he tried so hard. And then through the process of him explaining his logic be, behind the decisions he made of how he was going to make the, the worst painting ever, like I could tell that, I, I don't know, so much happened in that conversation. Like I could tell that him speaking those decisions out loud was teaching him something about what he did value and oh, what, that's, he was, that's, yeah. what he was trying to accomplish in his work. And by the end of the discussion, I felt like, I don't know, Galen was so good about this. It's just everybody had learned a tremendous amount about art making and images and our relationship to representation. And, you know, and, and the guy was at the very least, he just wasn't as venomous and you know, angry about <laughs> abstraction. I think at least he he kind of caught a glimmer of, you know, value there, that maybe there was something there that he hadn't seen before. So Venomous is such a <laughs> decisively strong word to use. He was, this this guy was just, you know, <laughs> you know it was righteous ign- indignation. Like he just felt like everybody was, that liked abstraction was trying to pull some kind of prank on us, you know? Well, there, and it is, it is kind of, it's such a tricky slope because there's, there is, you know, the feeling of when someone would clearly not spend any time on a project and you would, the people would earnestly try to critique it and you just knew this is just, this is ridiculous. You know, Mm -hmm. someone didn't care and we're trying to find something positive in something that's, you know, for sure. And that I think that art school can easily get um, stereotyped as having those, you know, fill, just filling it with a lot of air like that. And that's right. But that's not what this was. I think it's more the action of the assignment. It doesn't even matter the critique or whatever. Well, and if it, one people liked it or not or talked about it, it was just the physical action of like you 
I mean, well, one doing one it. detail that I yeah. didn't that I didn't include is that we all agreed there are bad paintings. Yeah. Like, and the guy okay. that came in, the other teacher that came in to to talk about him, you know, he was. I don't know. I I found that at at SA is School of University of Chicago that people were pretty brutally honest. Like there wasn't much, uh, you know, blowing sunshine. And the guy that the other teacher that came in just said, said right off the bat, like, these are two pretty ugly paintings, you know, <laughs> pretty bad. but, but given that, you know, he, he said, starting with that as the base, you know, like that these two things are bad. He was, he then went on to say, well, but I can kind of see something happening over here and this is what I see and mm -hmm. what, what might have value or what could be pushed and, and gained from, you know, pursuing that direction. So I, I, I guess I should say that like, it wasn't that he made two great paintings cause he didn't, but there were, there were aspects that we could have a conversation about both, uh, you know, and if you were to make a really your worst painting, would it, is it around, like, would it be, like for me, it would be trying to draw a figure, like draw <laughs> drawing some feet and some hands, because I can't really draw feet and hands. Like, would it I be... actually ended up did I yeah. did do a series? Yeah. Yeah. See them on my website. Oh. Have you? I've seen. Uh, I've I've shown you those before, right? It's not the. So that that is actually an assignment that ended up. Uh, uh, I ended up doing just as a way to get out of a rut. Yeah. I gave it to myself. I made a list of the things that I was said I would never make paintings of. Yes, yes, and, yes. And the a, gazebo yeah. one. Yeah, a gazebo, yeah. waterfall, uh, <laughs> teepees with a, you know, it's kind of the a combination between like cliche and like and highly emotional but substan like insubstantial types of images. Yeah. So, um, but that's interesting that you, that, that if you were to make, well, yeah. Oh. I kind of want to, I want to give that assignment. I think that's, I think that's a great. There, <sighs> there's so many different ways that that conversation can be taken. I, I feel like, you know, giving that assignment, there's so many different things to dig into there. I just really think it's a great one. Okay. What's next for you? Um, I, this one I loved, um, this was a type typography, um, class that I just love, love, love this pro assignment. We were all assigned randomly a different part of San Francisco. The school was, campus was in San Francisco. Um, and it was a radius of, I think it was like just a block. Like it was a small very small section, but it was, there was probably 18 of us in the class. And so there was 18 different locations spread all through the city like in the financial district in North beach and like the Italian part of town, like the Presidio way out by the water. And I was given this tiny, um, little block. And I guess it was maybe, no, you know, remembering now it was an actual no, that's right. It was an actual physical place. Like it was, so I was given this tiny Mexican restaurant on Mission Street, like in the heart of the mission in San Francisco. And we were to study this place and create a typography um, study of lettering, letters and, you know, how, what's the definition of typography? You know, it's type. Mm -hmm. create type and create a project um, based on this location. So you were to study, for, so for me it was really, really looking at line, like really studying the line of this, the, of this place. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a week in sitting in this tiny Mexican restaurant, um, family owned, and I loved the uh, project and we remember studying there there were these um kind of decorative um bars on the windows hmm. um kind of like that you know, twirled and did a whole did something with with the lines of these sort of script like um 
they wouldn't look like they look no, you'd see them normally any you know you'd see them on restaurants all the time but they so photographing and photographing and studying the lines of location I just thought was really really interesting just again making you just look really closely and be circumspect about the atmosphere and the environment around you mm. and I think I've always I've kept that to this day I mean I think about that a lot I'm always you know looking at the line within there was some, I have some green tomatoes today that I determined I want them to get right before it gets cold. Um, but they just put them on my windowsill and they just, the lines of the screen, the sun coming through and the screen on the window shadowing on these rounded tomatoes and just the curves of the lines. It was just really beautiful. Hmm. Has that affected your uh, I don't know. I can imagine now that you have this relationship to your surroundings where you're thinking in terms of creating a typography that would be unique to that place or how some somehow capture that place. Is that something that you, th mm. you still think of? of like how I maybe even not type typography, but how the character of a place could be translated into, you know, the artwork mm, i would so i'm sort of like give me that assignment Trent. give me that assignment because it i didn't mm. think of yeah i'd be that'd be really good i think i'm always looking at the lines of wherever i am um but to consciously really look and collect those and create something from that would be a great thing to do i can imagine that you'd you know, putting together like a vocabulary of of textures, of colors, and of a given location, and then making a series, you know, based on that. Mm -hmm. That'd be really interesting. But I know in the past you have talked a lot about the the effect that environment has on your your productivity and yeah. your art making. Do you feel like your actual color choices and your choices of shape and line and is that affected by your environment, or it was just Kind of oh, absolutely. I think, I think so. And I think this, the way the shadows lengthen the winter and the way, cause it's, it's the light and the shadow. It's, it's all, um, I feel funny. I can't really explain what it is right now with what I'm going to say about that, but yes, mm. sorry. Um, it just makes me think about how much. I, so, sorry, suddenly I just got self-conscious about trying to sound. I, to be honest, I'm really stuck right now. I feel, <laughs> it's funny, mm. because I'm doing, this is not an excuse, but I am focusing more on um, CrossFit and these, you know, engaging more with the city and getting to know people more and putting myself out there more, which I didn't do for the first year and a half I was here very much. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't really dropped down and dropped into my work and I haven't, um, I have two big things up on my walls and I'm just like, I just am not feeling it. I'm not feeling, and I'm trying to be a bit more okay with that right now because, you know, there's a time and a place for everything. Um, for sure. That's actually the that that Ecclesiastes line from the Bible is actually what I end up putting on when I did the typography on the blocks of the there's a season and time for everything under heaven. Mm. That long Ecclesiastes, which again we need to be more gentle about with ourselves because there is a season for all. We are so hard on ourselves about productivity creatively and yeah. Well, do you feel like those are mutually exclusive things? Like either you focus and and drop into your art making or you are trying to get out and be more connected to the city and other people. Like can th can those two things not coexist? I would love I would love them to, but I think I think um I would love them to. I think because this is sort of new and um and even physically, I'm kind of exhausted. My body, I like my arms from, <laughs> like mm -hmm. I went this morning, like my arms are kind of sore, which in a good way, which feels really good. But the idea of like picking up 
stuff and collaging, getting down on my knees and working on the floor. I'm like, uh, <laughs> right. you know, it's like a little bit of that too. Cause I think the physicality is such a big part of working for me. So, um, mm -hmm. I would get my exercise making art before <laughs> that was, that was not, that was not enough. <laughs> my third assignment uh, the one that Galen Gerber gave to me and awesome. uh, specifically. This actually was not an assignment he gave me in that class. Um, this was an assignment he gave me a semester later when I signed up to have him as a one of my two mentors. So he came to my studio and it was just a conversation between him and I and he gave me this assignment. At the time, I was struggling... Um, to kind of get to what I really wanted to be doing there mm -hmm. at the school, what I was trying to get from that experience, what I, what the work was that I was meant to be making at that time. I had spent the first year doing this collaboration with a, a religious community on the South side of Chicago and had decided to not do that and instead focus on just being at the school and getting the most out of being there at that, at that, having that experience. Uh, so I was, I was just kind of having this uh, hard time really getting to the root of what I even wanted to do there at school. What and what was, the, yeah, what was the kind of structure like as far as producing work or expectations as far as that went at, at that in point grad, for you? Well, in grad school, it's wide open, especially at contemporary schools. Like, there's no expectation as a painting student that I would ever even make paintings, like, they're so hmm. focused on this interdisciplinary, like do whatever you want. So as uh, you know, I applied to the painting program. I got in as a, as a painting student, but there were, I would say over half of my program weren't really doing traditional painting. Like one guy was doing these sound installations with speakers and another guy like, like, you know, it's just like all over the place. And which I think I think is a good thing and a healthy way to go, but um, in terms of like it having a structure, it's just there was no structure. Yeah, um, it was anti-structure, and so uh, we had essentially twenty-four hour, seven day a week access to our studios. We had one uh, mentor come in once a week, so we had two mentors in a semester uh, coming in alternating weeks. And that was pretty much it. They'd come in, they'd talk about whatever it is we were doing, kind of respond. It was pass fail, so it was not like they were coming in to like give us a grade. And uh, then why do no. you pay so much money for it? <laughs> that that is a really good question. You pay so much money for the name, the legitimacy of the institution. You pay so much to have access to you know, supposedly some of the best teachers yeah. around and, and the facilities at the school, the network of galleries yeah. and the kind of pipeline that, that being at that school puts you yeah. in. So I think, I don't think it's worth paying as much money as you do, but there are, I, that being said, if money weren't such a big issue, I had a fantastic experience at school yeah. and I, and I loved it and it was life changing and it, it was wonderful. But, you know, is it worth as much as you have to pay? Yeah, it's up for debate. It was just more trying to understand, like, not having that structure. It must be really self-driven where you have to go, I'm going to really reach out to this professor. I'm going to really, you know, explore yes. the interdisciplinary, and what I have access to. I'm going to really, you know, yeah. show up for it. It's got to be self, self-driven self and you're in grad school. So, I mean, it, it makes sense that they would give you that kind of reason. They assume right. that in undergraduate, you came, you came to a little bit more clarity of what you actually right. really want to do and that you have the self-discipline and maturity to, to guide yourself, um, and seek out help when you, when you are struggling. Um, and people were very accommodating in that regard as well. Like if you wanted to somebody that wasn't your mentor to come in and you for a studio visit, they would often be willing to. So. Anyway, so uh, this is all to say that I was at kind of a rough place, uh, kind of s trying to find what I wanted to do. He gave me the assignment of taking the afternoon off to, and doing nothing and going and getting food that was like the food that I would get if I was treating myself, you know, for a day. Mm -hmm. um, so like, go get a pizza. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, sit down, 
and take your time. You don't do anything for the rest of the afternoon. Eat that pizza. And then my, his assignment was to make a list. He was all about the lists, and I think lists are fantastic. Yeah. Too. Um, but he said, make a list of all the things, you know, the things that really draw you to art making. What is it that you love? Mm. And, um, you know, I, my list had things like big, like size, uh, squishy paint, rich color, like, you know, like I, I think you and I probably are similar in our, our kind of fascination and love for the vis- visceral nature of like art materials and, yeah. and making stuff. Like I, I love the kind of hands-on aspect of, of art making. The explanation he gave had something to do with um, that art making necessarily is, you know, a self, it's about yourself, right? It's about connecting with uh, something that's inside you, expressing, getting that out. And um, so it's self-indulgent to a certain degree. Yeah. And so actually going out and just being kind of self-indulgent for the afternoon and getting into that place of just kind of allowing yourself, giving yourself permission to to think about what it is that you love, that it's all about you. What is What is it that you really connect with what what is it that drives you what is it that you long for what is it, what, what are your desires and appetites and um, really try to get to the foundation of what that is um, and that's going to teach you what it is that you know you need to create because it's got to come from that place it can't come from external motivators it can't come from what is selling right now in the art market or what it is it that art critics want to see or what is everybody else doing and how can I like pull the best from that you know right. it's like it, it's got to come from a much deeper place so I thought it was a fantastic assignment and I uh, felt like did uh, what kind of clarity did you get um I think just that you know that it relieved me from the stress like going out and actually physically taking the day off you know and dismissing all of what I was supposed to be doing that day from my mind <laughs> and just having it be about like what does Trent want today I want a pizza. I'm going to go get a pizza. And I sat down and I like, you know, just had the whole afternoon to spread out and to think about and not have, uh, you know, my thoughts crowded, uh, crowded out by other, other concerns. And, and like just gave me permission to take the time to actually identify and make it real by making a list, like putting it, putting it out into the world on a piece of paper. Do you have that Uh, list still? No, no, that's long gone. But I ended up making these, ginormous uh paintings like yeah 16 feet by wow uh can't remember and i was using like squirt bottles filled with acrylic paint and they're out on my floor and then i stretched them on these massive like obviously the huge really long stretchers made these huge paintings wow anyway it was it was very liberating hmm what did you do with the paintings? Well, they're massive. Uh, they're, yeah, I know. That's that's that's, <laughs> that's the thing. I love that, and it was a fantastic assignment, and I learned a lot, and I felt like you know, if nothing else, it was just like a great vacation from you know cares and concerns. But like the reality of painting that large and storing it and transporting it, and you know that. that Tell me about of, it. Yeah. Yes, so, I know what, you understand this. What yeah. did they? But what did? So what ended up happening to them? Um, I ended up repurposing the the paintings, like cutting them down and making smaller paintings on yeah, that's the, the way to top go. of them. And uh, I'm sure some some of it got thrown away in the stretcher bars. I probably gave to somebody else because I can't. I'm not going to take 16 foot stretcher bar across the country back to California, and I wasn't doing more 16 foot paintings, so. Anyway, <sighs> so yes, and I don't even think I took a picture of it. I think I had it up for a critique, and those were the days before smartphones, and like those are definitely the days before smartphones. That was so long ago. <laughs> yeah, there were yeah. well, yeah, maybe there were cell phones. Nah. I remember some guy coming to. I had somebody come take digital images of my work, which was kind of a big deal at yeah. even at the time. Um, and he brought out this camera and it was like, it was like, you know, when you see old cell phones on movies from the eighties, you know, it's just 
like this massive brick. This camera, this DSLR, it was one of the first ones, you know, just massive, like comically large camera. Anyway. Hmm. I, speaking of that era, I will tell you my my last one that I real. Oh, there's more, but I'll tell you my third one um, is... I was, I mean, incredible, incredible photography teacher, Chris Johnson, who I really hope will be on the show, the episode, um, the podcast one day. He's just deeply soulful, extraordinary human being. Um, we had to document, it was a documentary project, and we had to document something or a place. I don't remember exactly the description of the assignment, but I decided, so, to document each room in the dorm I lived in. Um, so it was 19 rooms in this one hallway of 18, 19 year olds. And all, you know, we were all artists, um, but young and just beginning to kind of find our, find our way and what, what we were drawn to. So the stories that happened behind these doors I mean, every room is exactly the same, but and usually you and it was you know the rooms are probably probably maybe eighteen by eighteen feet I think or I could smaller I'm, I'm a little bigger I don't remember, but there were two of us in every room, and then we had three RAs um, there were so um, I had such a whole thing with my RA like totally <laughs> scandalous awesome. Page, if you're listening, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, so we I went into each room and these kind of we shot with a fisheye lens. Um, the the dynamic between the two people, you know, usually it seemed that you were paired with someone that was really different than you, and so how you creatively d divide up the space and have your own sort of creative environment because also we were having to do our projects in these rooms like we had to build things and make stuff and share the small space mm -hmm. and the ways people tried to divide the space the people next to us had a um small kiddie pool with like live turtles in it the <laughs> the ra that was connected to my room through a bathroom she had huge iguanas that she was like washing in the sink <laughs> <laughs> And um, I just, it was really interesting to, 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 to do. And I, I made a little, I made a book out of it. Um, and I've always thought, so that year, the year that was, would be, I guess it would be 95, 96. It was 95. So I thought how interesting it would be to go find, somehow find uh those people somehow maybe through the alumni or somehow see if I could find them and go photograph them in their rooms or their homes now 20 years later mm. <laughs> that'd be great or just find out kind of what what happened to them what who went on to do what and um do you still have all those photographs from you them? know I do thinking of remembering all my stuff coming that was the box that had all my negatives in it that my dad was like a pizza box it wasn't even taped closed I'm like <laughs> oh there's my entire all my negatives and you know whatever. and I, I saw that those were in there so I do have all the negatives um, that's fantastic that'd be awesome if you could you could scan those yeah I think I have a copy of and I have all the I have all the prints too it was really good it was really great. Well, that is, uh, I was just thinking, it seems like a lot of your, the, well, the assignments that you chose, the projects you chose, had a lot to do with connecting with environment, mm -hmm. you know, like your rooms or this, this city and, or, you know, spatial relationships. That's true. And the, the projects that I chose have to do more with, like, internal yeah internal like struggle and internal landscape i guess or like psychology well can you think of off off the top of your head anything that was actually that was not that way that was not with that teacher my mind is so much into that class yeah, right now yeah. that I, uh, i'm 
nothing else has come to mind right now. But I think I think though that that's what I love about teaching, and also what I love about art making is the is the internal, like the psychological, the like I don't know. I it really makes me want to be teaching right now. There's that mm. part too. There's the making time, and then there's the teaching time. For sure. I'm excited for when we have classes. And that is it, guys. Go make a three-dimensional autobiographical book. Uh, Room the Trees is brought to you by Trent Reynolds and me, Sabrina Harrison. I'm recording this outro in the car on the way to a farmstead in northern Wisconsin. And the sun is setting, and it's beautiful. You can find the show notes at roominthetrees.com. And leave us a review on iTunes. You can do that uh, by going to ruinthetrees.com slash iTunes. And um, become a patron um, for three bucks or five bucks. That's patreon.com forward slash or backslash, I'm not sure, room. And uh, we'll talk to you next week. And have a great weekend and make some stuff and explore some stuff and just enjoy a bit of fall weather it's beautiful today bye